So now that we've made sure that the light collected by our two telescope reaches our camera at the same time, we can finally look into the detail that make up the actual um, beam recombiner. And there are really two ways to go about designing one such focal station. Um, the first way of doing so is going to use a co-axial recombination mode, and the second way is going to use a multi-axial recombination mode. And those two modes uh, have some slightly different properties that we need to go over to really understand how this works. The first one is going to be the co-axial mode. Uh, one such uh, recombination mode relies primarily on a type of uh, optical component known as a beam splitter that allows you at a given point on our optical train to overimpose the, the electric field coming from two places and produces two outputs that are simply directed toward two detectors. That can be as simple as uh, photodiodes, uh, single pixel detectors, simply looking at the evolution of the intensity coming out of uh, these two outputs. Now, if we don't add anything else to the system, assuming that the tracking of our telescopes, that the, um, the, the delay lines work operate perfectly, we're not going to see anything interesting happening on our detectors. We're simply going to see one of the outputs is going to be very bright, the other one is going to be very dark. And uh, we're only going to be able to say that our interferometer is perfectly in phase. Which is good, but not that exciting. Uh, in order to see something more interesting with what such system, we're going to have to introduce an additional modulation of the optical path on one of the interferometric arms. And the way we do so is, for instance, by using a piezo-driven mirror that's going to oscillate, or at least follow a pretty fine um, trajectory over time, that's going to introduce voluntarily a time-varying optical path difference. And the effect of that optical path difference is going to, uh, we're going to see some modulation occur on the two outputs of our detectors. Uh, when the light path coming from the two telescopes are such that the light is perfectly in phase for one of the outputs, then we're going to see very bright. If uh, the modulation is such that the two uh, electric fields are uh, out of phase, then uh, we're going to see dark outputs. And uh, if we follow exactly the, the outputs as a function of um, piezo mirror position, we're going to see something that will look like what you have here on the screen. You look at the, uh, the, the evolution of this intensity as a function of the delay delta here. And uh, you see uh, this modulation occur. Now, this, the temporal modulation gives you access to uh, several numbers. The first one is simply the overall strength of the signal. If you, um, to if you compute the total amount of light you receive on both outputs at any given time, you are able to somehow get access to how bright your target is, which is interesting. But the more interesting bits come from uh, measuring the amplitude of the modulation, uh, which is something you're going to be able to relate to the, uh, uh, the visibility modulus. And uh, the other thing is going to be the uh, phase of the fringes, that is the uh, relative location of the uh, successive minima and maxima of your fringes uh, in comparison to this overall envelope function that you see on, on the screen here. Uh, in order to see the entire uh, coherence envelope um, using one such technique, you need to make sure that the amplitude of the modulation you do uh, using your piezo mirror is of the order of magnitude of that coherence length. The data you're left with is something that we call uh, fringe packets, and the interpretation of those fringe packets is going to be the object of um, future uh, modules here. This recombination mode relies primarily on a, d a device called a, a beam splitter that is essentially a, um, uh, a slab of glass that allows you to um, simply overimpose in space the two electric fields. Um, you have some of the light that is reflected by a semi-reflective um, surface, 
and some of the light that is transmitted. The uh, interferences of the, um, of the reflected and transmitted parts make that the outputs E3 and E4 of this uh, beam splitter end up being linear combinations of the inputs E1 and E2. The beam splitter itself can be formally described as some, uh, with some kind of um, two by two matrix, uh, which is simply referred to as the, the beam splitter matrix. And the properties of that uh, matrix actually depend on the details of uh, the beam splitter itself. But it's uh, simply a system that is linear in complex amplitude or electric field. This is an example of an actual instrument relying on uh, this kind of beam splitter that is uh, the instrument known as AMBER, which is a first generation uh, combiner for VLTI that, like you see on the picture, uses heaps of uh, beam splitters. Uh, in fact, we are going to see that in practice you need a lot more than one beam splitter, even for a simple two telescope interferometer. But we'll see that later. Um, now you are going to see on this picture here that we can actually, uh, the technology uh, has evolved quite a bit and we are now able to make fairly complex uh, interferometric recombiners using integrated optics as opposed to the bulk optics that we're using in Amber. And in this case, uh, we have a beam combiner for four telescopes on, uh, on the VLTI. This is for an instrument a second generation instrument at VLTI called Gravity. Uh, and the beam recombiner here, can, you can actually hold it entirely in the palm of your hand, which is a uh, testimony to the, the progress we've made in terms of technology. So if you look at uh, synthetically at the pros and cons of um, the co-axial recombination scheme, you see that uh, what, what I would list as a limitation first is that um, it uses single it relies on single single mode beams what that means is that the information that is provided by individual apertures themselves because they have some re angular resolution uh, is actually lost uh, when you do the, when you do the, this type of combination and that results in uh, observations limited of uh, within a, a very small uh, field of view typically the order of the, the diffraction size of one single telescope um, and like you saw uh, with uh, the, the picture of uh, Amber, for example, you, this type of architecture can result in, in, a, in a fairly complex optical design and the complexity of this design actually grows with the square of the total number of telescopes that are used uh, in the array. On the other hand, we have a lot of interesting properties coming from that type of recombiners. The first interesting property is that um, the beams are actually single mode. Now I know that I've listed this as a limitation because uh, it does indeed affect um, the field of view. In practice, uh, being able to use uh, single mode um, signals is actually very interesting. Um, first thing is that because you don't care about the low spatial frequency information, you can actually uh, inject the signal um, and project it onto uh, single pixel detectors, which uh, are very efficient and uh, optimize the sensitivity of the signal you're trying to look at. The other properties are that you can inject the signal into, um, into optical fibers, which means that the beam transportation problems are suddenly made a lot easier. Uh, and you can also, of course, if you have fibers, uh, get into integrated optics. Um, chips and you saw uh, the difference between Ember and gravity. Uh, integrated optics are clearly the way to go with these sort of things. And in practice, uh, you can, if you design very well your recombiner, you can come up with solutions that enable very high quality of uh, calibration. The second way of combining the light is to use a multi-axial recombination scheme. And that is going to look somewhat familiar if you remember the picture from uh, uh, the early 19th century experiments. In this case here, we're using um, simply uh, the two light path and directly overimpose the electric fields onto the detector here. Another way to do this uh, would be to simply use um, an imaging system, 
to collect the light coming out of the two telescopes, for example using a third telescope, and uh, simply look at the, uh, at the diffraction uh, features of the, the, the point spec function produced by one such system here. Uh, you're going to see that fringes appear in the diffraction pattern uh, produced by one such system. And th this clearly looks like the old system of um, Stefan that we saw in the introduction to this module. If you do so, however, um, you are now going to, be, to have to collect the light on a 2D uh, detector array, which means that you're going to use a lot more pixels to collect that information and maybe uh, experience some sensitivity loss. However, uh, what, you, uh, what you lose in space, you earn in time. Uh, with one such system, you don't have to introduce artificial uh, light path modulation like we had in the coaxial case. Here, it's the, 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 the 2D structure of your fringes already provides you uh, with, uh, with all of the information you are looking for in the first place. You have spatially extended fringes that give you access to the exact same information. The total intensity, which is simply the integrated signal over your, um, your detector, the modulus of uh, the visibility, which is again going to be provided by the amplitude of the fringes, how bright are the bright fringes, how dark are the dark fringes, and the phase, again related to the location of the minima and maxima of my fringes on my uh, detector. One extra piece of information here is that the, the, the spacing between the fringes um, does not depend on the target you're looking at. Uh, in this case, it is simply imposed by the um, geometric properties of the recombiner itself. Here I have plotted two, uh, two pictures of fringes, uh, the one on the left here, and, um, and by simply uh, reducing the angle between the two beams uh, hitting the detector, you can actually reduce the number of fringes, make them a little thicker, um, and uh, the, but, but the information about the amplitude and the phase still remains encoded uh, the same way in those fringes. <coughs> <coughs> um, just like in the coaxial case, there are some pros and cons for one such configuration. The first one is that, um, the first limitation is that the beam transportation optics are more demanding because we want to preserve uh, the small uh, scale and the, and the large scale information in there and uh, multiple wavelength observations are trickier, harder to, to reach. And since we care for the low order special frequency features of the target, then we want, uh, we typically require the telescopes to, um, to have a, a better overall waveform correction. So we are going to use uh, adaptive optics in this case. What is interesting with one such system is that uh, since all information is preserved, it potentially gives us access to a very wide field of your information. And uh, the other bit of uh, interest is that uh, one such system easily scales with the number of apertures. Uh, once the optics are set uh, to provide fringes for one, simply shoving in another beam and you're going to get uh, uh, three aperture uh, fringes. And it's very adapted uh, in comparison to the previous case, to dense arrays, arrays for which uh, the size of the aperture is somewhat comparable to the baseline of your interferometer. It's a situation that you experience when you put a mask in front of a telescope to do uh, masking interferometry, or when you're using a telescope like the LBT. Um, and the LBT, in case you don't know, is a telescope made of two 8-meter uh, telescopes that sit together on one uh, single common mount. And um, if you look at uh, the details, uh, there is a way um, to recombine the light coming from those two telescopes into uh, an interferometric recombiner, it's called Link uh, Nirvana. And uh, it's a, uh, that is typically a configuration that is going to be multi-axial to take advantage of the wide field of view capability of one such interferometer. Now, in a couple of occasions here, I've mentioned the idea of using more than two telescopes uh, to do interferences. And we're going to look next into what you need to do and how you would go about doing interferences with more than two telescopes together. <coughs>